Uh, good morning and welcome to this 22nd meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones or put them on silent and for members to keep them off the desk. Um, we have apologies this morning from our colleague David Torrance and we're going to move straight in to our first uh, agenda item this morning because we have two panels in front of this morning. I'm uh, minded to give about 45 minutes to each panel so we are, have already warned the members quick questions and if we can have succinct answers that would be really helpful indeed. Um, so uh, we're continuing with our stage one on the gender representation of public boards scrutiny um, and we have uh, as I say two panels the, this morning. Uh, with us this morning we have Bill Thompson who's a commissioner and Melanie Stronach who's a public appointments officer from the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland. Lynn Welsh is the head of Legal for Scotland Equality and Human Rights Commission. Liz Scott who's a quality manager from Highlands and Isles Enterprise. Professor James Mc Goldrick, who's the convener of Scottish Social Services Council, and Fiona Moss, who's the head of Health Improvement and Inequalities at Glasgow City Integration Joint Board. Can we welcome you all to committee this morning? And thank you so much for all, all your written evidence. It was very helpful indeed. Um, I'm going to uh, go to each member of the panel and ask us just to give you a, give us a quick understanding of who you are, what you do, and your thoughts on the bill. And if I can maybe start with Liz. Yes, no, thanks very much for, for inviting Hi to come along today. Um, Hi is a Highlands and Islands Enterprise um, Economic and, and Community Development Agency for the North and West of Scotland. Um, we are keen to promote the business and economic case for um, diversity on boards, um, both across the public sector and also into the private sector. Um, we welcome the bill. Um, I think there are opportunities to um, ensure that we increase the number of skilled and capable women um, who are a able to come into positions of decision making and governance on boards. Um, and we've worked um, quite closely with the Scottish Government over the last few years. Um, and as a result of that, we've actually increased the diversity on our um, own board quite significantly. Um, and we've worked on, on some interesting initiatives um, that are around both to help increase the, the, ta the talent pipeline coming through and also in our own board membership. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Professor McGoldrick. Hi, I'm Jim McGoldrick. I'm the convener of the Scottish Social Services Council. We are the regulator for the social services workforce. That's 100,000 people are currently on our register. Um, so it's a big, uh, a big workforce, but we're a relatively small board. And part of my contribution today will be some of the issues that there are around a board that's got 10 people on it, because a small number can make big percentages in terms of a 50-50 target. Uh, but we're, we're also the um, Sector Skills Council for the Social Services Workforce in Scotland. Thank you very much. Fiona. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Fiona Moss. I uh, head up Health Improvement and Equalities uh, in Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership. We were obviously created through the Public Bodies Joint Working Act in 2014, along with all other integration joint boards in Scotland. We are the largest uh, uh, integration board in Scotland, um, and we put a return in because we are not listed in the bill. Um, but we have about 9,000 staff, over a billion pounds of spend, providing health and social care for all age groups in Glasgow City. And we were surprised not to be in the bill. We would support gender parity uh, in boards, including our integration joint board. OK, thank you very much, Fiona. Mr Thompson. Uh, I won't repeat my title because it takes up too much time. Uh, in terms of my interest in public appointments, um, that is limited to regulated appointments which are specified in statute. I support the gender representation objective in section one of the bill. Um, I thought it might be helpful if I clarify what I understand the current position to be in terms of women appointed to public boards in Scotland. Um, and I'm limiting my comments to regulated appointments. That, by the way, is 640 posts spread across 94 public boards, which of course is slightly smaller than the total number of boards covered by the bill. Um, you've had, in the evidence you've had so far, various figures for the number of women, uh, including 36%, um, which was the position in 2014. Um, in 2015-16, um, you have as in the SPICE briefing, 42% um, of regulated posts were held by women. 
In 2016-17, that increased to 45.1%. Sorry, that's very precise. Um, <laughs> that's a whole person. Um, as of September of this year, um, the number of women in regulated posts was 45.8% of the total. And if you split that down between chairs, where there are far fewer women, the number of chairs that represent 25% of the total, but the number of board members, excluding chairs, is actually 48.9% are women. Um, and I think it's helpful to be aware that ministerial appointments uh, in 2014 45.6% of appointees were women. In 2015, that had increased to 53.6%. And in 2016, 58.6%. So for the last two years, more women have been appointed by ministers to regulated posts than men. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> we'll come back to that. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, Melanie. Yes, I'm uh, Melanie Stronach, I'm Public Appointments Officer. I work in Bill Thompson's office, so I'm here um, as I suppose, a specialist in that area for the work that Bill does. OK, thank you. Thank you. Lynn. Uh, yeah, I'm the Head of Legal at the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Our job is to promote and protect equality across Great Britain, um, and we share our human rights mandate with our sister organisation, the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, we obviously therefore have a direct interest in the legislation that's going through, um, and I suppose particularly its interaction with the public sector duties that are in the Equality Act, which we have a very particular role uh, of regulator in relation to. Okay, thank you very much. It gives us a, an overview of where, where you're all at uh, and where your influence is, but we're going to go straight into questions, and I'm going to start with Mary. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel, and thank you for providing um, written evidence for us. It's, it's very helpful. Um, can I just ask a, a specific question about the, the definition that's used in the bill? Because while I, I absolutely um, understand and support the principle behind um, the bill, some of our witnesses have raised concern that the bill isn't inclusive of trans women and it has a, a binary definition of, of gender. So there is no way of, of incorporating or including people that identify as, as non-binary. So I, I'd be interested in, in the panel's views on that, because there is legislation across EU states that, that has a, a similar aim, but uses a different definition of, of gender. So I'd be keen to hear the panel's views on what can be done to achieve this. Um, yeah. As you probably are aware, the Scottish Government is restricted in how it can legislate in this area mm -hmm. by the devolved competence that it was given under the Scotland Act, which requires the legislation to, um, in effect, fit with protected characteristics mm -hmm. that are set out in the Equality Act. So I think that there is that restraint to some extent on what the um, Scottish Government can do. Um, I, I, I know, however, that the um, Equality Network have suggested mm -hmm. an amendment that would, in effect, extend the bill to cover trans women also, mm -hmm. um, and as long as that fits with the protected characteristic definitions in the Equality Act, I can't see a reason why that wouldn't be possible. OK, OK. Can I just say, my, my interest is in diversity in its broadest sense. Um, I, I accept entirely what Lynn has said um, about the statutory limits of the government's ability to operate in this area. Um, and I think the government, by the way, I don't think it's just um, my view, is interested in diversity in its broader sense. Um, so I, I have no problem with wh what you're suggesting. Um, legally, I can see there might, there might be a difficulty. In, in, in what way? Because the bill is addressing protected characteristics, as I understand it, mm. which is what the Scottish Government has power to do, as okay. I understand it, under the 2016 Act. Um, but there's also, as you're probably well aware, there's an exception in Section 4.4 of the Bill, um, which allows, certainly in terms of ministerial appointments, um, reference to other characteristics or circumstances, which mm. I would have thought is broad enough to cover the issue which you're raising. OK. OK, thank you. Fiona? Um, I, I guess I'm not 
an expert on the legal side, we did have some thought around how we would deal with that as a, an integration <coughs> joint board, and we would look for a way in which um, the gender that someone wanted to be known by was recognised in their membership on our board, obviously within legal constraints. So I wouldn't see that this bill would necessarily make that particularly difficult. It would, of course, make it difficult if someone identified as non-binary. I think the issue for us is that in, in most terms people identify a particular gender they're with. That might not be the gender they were born with, mm -hmm. but a, a gender that they identify with. And we would look to recognise that where we could within legal confines. I don't know the legalities of that, I'm afraid. OK, thank you. <clears throat> James or, or Liz, do you want to comment at all? No, I think the, the, for us, one of the big challenges are, is around the other protected characteristics. We, we've tended to have a pretty balanced uh, gender profile of our board over the years. Uh, but if that comes up later on, perhaps I'd say a little bit more then. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, can I... Yeah, of course. Of course if I can just add something to that. I think um, probably some of the other colleagues here are, are um, more afraid with the legal definitions. But I think certainly to ensure that we're covering all the protected characteristics, it would be really good to, to be able to cover those non-binary issues. But I think where um, it becomes more difficult, I think, is if we were requiring people or organisations to report on um, proportions of board members at an individual board member uh, board level, mm. because that's where the small numbers come in. I think it would be right to have to be able to um, cut across all the protected characteristics at a, an aggregated level. So if you're looking at across the public sector as a whole, across the different sectors within the public sector, health sector, transport, whatever. Um, so I think the principle's good, but it's the practicalities at those small numbers that I think create an issue. OK, thank you. Thank okay. you. We are hearing from the Trans Alliance next week, so hopefully we can interrogate this a bit further. But if you've got any other comments on that, we're happy, happy to hear it. Um, Jamie Green. Um, I wondered if anyone on the panel had any thoughts on the financial implications of the bill uh, in terms of how various organisations who will be subject to meet the requirements might have to deal with, for example, additional, are there a wide variety of things that could affect them wide, uh, including uh, additional recruitment costs, uh, management of the reporting mechanisms, or even at government level, uh, the, the, uh, the monitoring and reporting of, uh, and management of this entire process, given that there are uh, quite a substantial number of public bodies that it affects. Does anyone have any views on specifically on the, on the financial implications of the bill? I'd be quite keen to hear those. This in terms of particularly the point you made about reporting. If we have to have a different set of reporting arrangements other than the ways that we naturally report uh, our activities, that might have a financial implication for us. But otherwise, we think if we can report through our normal, uh, our annual report, having a, a, a section that it covers gender equality, we don't see there being a big implication as things stand. Right. If I, if I could comment, I think for organisations that are close to gender parity or have gender parity at the moment, the cost will not be uh, substantial. But for those organisations that are quite far away from it, um, that will be the case. I did have a look, uh, as you do on Google, at the gender representation on some of the organisations you've listed in the bill. And some are there, some are quite far away. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit of which, um, if I was an organisation, that had only a third or less women on my board, it would involve quite a lot of work for me because I would need to go and put a whole range of efforts in place to be able to bring forward women to apply, women to be supported, um, women coming through organisations in different professional roles, if that's what you have on your board. So it's, it depends on the business of that organisation as to the cost. So there'll be some like ours where actually I would be saying we, we have gender to parity now, so we don't have that cost. There's others that would be significant. Okay, can I uh, pick you up on that then? Uh, does that, where do you think that money should come from? I mean, given that these are primarily publicly funded bodies with finite budgets, if, if an organisation is so far away from where they need to be, 50%, say 2 in 10 or 3 in 10, for example, and there is going to be fairly substantial cost to get them up to that level, should those organisations be paying for that or should additional funds be made available to them to help them meet that commitment? 
Uh, what a horrible question to ask me. Sorry. Uh, as, a, as a public no right organisation, I would always say we need some additional funding. Um, the reality is I think it's probably a blend of the two. It depends how quickly you want it to happen um, and how far away they are. If you need it to happen more quickly and you're quite far away, you will probably need to give something to enable it to happen or support particular developments. Um, one of the areas we're interested in is looking at mentoring schemes that bring on more women to certain areas. You might want to support that kind of activity for those organisations or the range of organisations that are further away. Can I, I, I wouldn't want the, the potential cost to be o overstated. There's substantial support and available information. <clears throat> organisations who can assist um, with uh, how that work should be done, partner up with a uh, perhaps a board who's already excellent in that area. I, I don't think that the monetary cost uh, would be that substantial. And when you weigh it against equality and the huge benefits that are got from having women on your board, I think it's a very reasonable cost that would be involved. I, I think there's no denying that equality has no price in, in that respect, but I think it is important to recognise that uh, boards have budgets to manage and any additional costs will need to come from either existing budgets which are already spent or additional funding made available by the government. I think it's, it's, a, I think it's a fair observation. I, mean, I guess also that, that these organisations as public bodies will have been covered by their public sector duty apart from other legislation uh, for a number of years mm -hmm. and arguably should have been building their work in this area for quite a period of time and not hit with a sudden a sudden bill, and I think, uh, yeah, it, it would be good if they would take the responsibility now, perhaps, for some of that work. I think it's also important to be aware of other resources that could support the kind of points that Fiona made about boards that are far away from the target, because there is a, a and I, I don't know if this came up in the evidence from the IOD, but there is a Scottish Government IOD partnership around its uh, developing board uh, potential. Uh, particularly for uh, gender representation. So th th there actually is a resource already there that I suppose it's being aware of that and being able to tap into that as opposed to an additional cost to a specific board. Maybe, Bill Thompson, I know that your office have been doing some work with the Scottish Government Public Appointments team. Maybe it's a, if you can uh, give us some insight into the work you've done in advancing some of the public organisations. Yes. Um, our experience is that there's a combination of things required in order to improve the diversity on boards, and most of them have actually been mentioned from other witnesses already this morning. Um, part of it is the profile of the board, so that people know that it's there. Um, part of it is making sure that profile makes it interesting so that people want to participate. And I'm talking in diversity in the broader sense, not, uh, yes, gender diversity is very important. Um, there's a momentum towards gender diversity already, I would suggest, at least in terms of regulated appointments. Um, and I don't think it will cost very much more for that momentum to carry forward. Um, but there will be other underrepresented groups who are more difficult to reach, more difficult to interest, uh, and who may have greater needs in terms of being um, board ready. Um, You've heard about mentoring. There are quite a few mentoring schemes underway. Um, I think these are very effective. Um, if you want to keep the process open, which is what it should be, which is to avoid cronyism, it's the whole reason for having any regulated public appointments in the first place, um, you have to be careful to try and keep the pipeline sufficiently open so that it's not just a particular cohort that are taken through a pipeline, come out the end, and then are appointed. Um, so, yes, there is work involved in that. There's effort. It also requires, whether ministerial appointments, it requires the minister, or certainly those who are advising the minister, to think carefully about what they're looking for. Because if you... This is terribly obvious. If you ask the same questions, you'll get the same answers. And one of the things that has changed is that ministers, in the specification for the role, are asking different... They're setting it out differently, effectively asking different questions, and therefore getting different answers. Um, how much that costs, I'm, I'm not in a position to say. I don't know. Okay, Jamie, do you want to come back in? No? Okay. Alec O'Hamill. Thank you, Good morning to the panel. Thanks very much for coming to see us today. Um, 
I, I should say from the outset, I wholeheartedly support the principles behind this bill, but I am concerned that when we legislate and we don't put sufficient teeth behind that legislation, particularly in the equalities agenda, we become dangerously close to uh, virtue signalling um, because legislation for legislation's sake, when it's not backed up by sanctions or anything that can actually implement the, the will of that bill is, is pretty pointless. And I know that I'm not alone on this committee in, among colleagues who are concerned that there is a profound absence of sanction or teeth behind this to compel or induce um, boards that are dragging their heels uh, to, to bring their standards up to, to what we would hope them to be. And I wonder if the panel would like to reflect on perhaps how we could strengthen this bill beyond the reporting duty, which to my mind is really the only kind of uh, measure which is going to put pressure on boards to, to up their game um, and where those, where, in what sections of the bill you think those, that strengthening could take place. Len, would, would you have something to say on that? <laughs> I'm just thinking in your role as a, as, as, you know, a guarantor almost here. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, th there's a fine line to be walked, I think it's fair to say. Um, obviously, we have to keep on the side of positive action and not positive discrimination. We're constrained by EU law in that regard. Um, and one of the issues that has come through in various cases at EU uh, level is um, if your sanctions, if you have sanctions at all, are too severe, do they uh, breach the positive action idea and move to positive, or, or uh, encourage boards to take positive discrimination and therefore the actual sanctions are unlawful or the, your, your uh, positive action can be unlawful. So there's a balance to be struck. And I suppose it depends how much you want to push and how much you want to pull. Um, I, can see, I can see that some form of, of regulation or sanction uh, may get boards who haven't taken this issue seriously to date to take it more seriously. Um, what those would look like, I suppose, is, is open to discussion. Uh, being public authorities, you wouldn't, I guess, want to see substantial fines, which may be counterproductive, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so it would be something, I, get, I suppose, that actually got the work done that was required to meet the bill. So, for example, in the public sector duty, we can, as a regulator, um, issue compliance notices which are in effect a sort of action plan or get the body to do this is the action I will take. We will hold you to that legally and can enforce that through the courts. So the sanction in effect is taking the action you failed to take so that you actually are achieving something rather than simply being punitive. Good. As a board chair, this is a question that uh, I've tussled with a little bit and I think that the idea of sanctions is for non-compliance and I worry about the, the law of unintended consequences is that you appoint to meet the compliance requirement as opposed to the broader aim of the, what the organisation is trying to achieve. I think probably that with what's currently available, that the non-compliant boards are naming and shaming kind of sanctions probably available anyway. Uh, but I do take the point about fines and other things is that I think it would dis potentially disrupt the work of a board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you've given some guidance in the past on how, how you know, yes. boards should operate, so maybe... Um, my guidance is really f for ministers in terms of the appointment process, um, which I think mm -hmm. takes me to my main point in answering the question. The certainly regulated appointments are made by ministers not by the public bodies. The public bodies have a role, um, and the better they play that role, provided the minister's aware of what's going on, which I'm sure they will be, um, the better the contribution will be. Um, bodies do have two requirements under the bill, which is to promote gender equality, but because they don't make the appointments I think it would be very difficult sensibly to apply any penalty to the board, given that the appointment is made by somebody else. And I think the, the teeth, as you put it, um, actually need to be looked for in slightly more subtle ways. Um, you as a committee, this parliament can hold, does hold ministers to account. Um, ministers as I understand it, have a sponsorship arrangement with the bodies whom they support. Um, and I, 
I believe, and you'll need to ask somebody else for the detail, I believe that those sponsorship arrangements are changing so that there's greater emphasis on diversity and what the board is doing um, if there is a diversity issue within the board. Um, now, that won't be public, um, obviously, but the minister certainly would be able to answer questions on that. Um, and I, th I actually think naming and shaming public reporting is more powerful than it might sound. Um, there have been a number of boards in the public eye of late in an uncomfortable way. I don't think anybody in their right mind wants to be there. Um, and if public opinion is strongly enough behind gender diversity or diversity more broadly, and a board falls foul of that, um, I think that would be an extremely uncomfortable place to be, and I don't see anybody sitting there for very long. <laughs> Fiona? Could I just add to what Bill has said uh, around the integration uh, joint boards? Um, it's set out in legislation, the members of our board, so we have an equal split between elected members and non-executive members of NHS boards. So in reality, our board mem membership is on the whole determined by bodies that, that, that we don't control as an integrated joint board. So I think it just gives an example to, to Bill's point. And I would also agree that um, all your public bodies do actually want to be doing the best job they can. So we do not want to be um, singled out for our ill performance uh, and not achieving. So there is something where we, we do want to work to, to, to be good in that. If I could just Chips. build on that point, Chair. Um, our board is uh, 10 people. Uh, one of whom is the chair of the care inspectorate. So the gender of that person is determined by nature, but <laughs> in terms of appointment. Our terms of reference say that we need to have two people who are registered with the, the SSC, and we need to have two people who have experience as carers or users of, users of service. So there's actually about half of our board we almost have no control over mm -hmm. who that person would be, so it would be a complicating factor for us. Okay. I'm grateful to you all for those uh, very fulsome answers. Um, I think Bill makes a very good point in terms of reporting and, and actually how strong naming and shaming can be. And we have a reporting duty in this bill, uh, but that's only a duty on the public bodies to report to ministers. Um, I think, to my mind, I'd be looking to amend this to, to have a, a duty on ministers then to report to Parliament on, on that process. So there is a, a, a more public airing of how we're doing on this issue. If I may convene it, just on, in terms of strengthening... And Mr McGoldrick talked about uh, provisions within the Act, and I'd like to come to them. It seems to me that we actually still give quite a significant degree of subjectivity and wiggle room in the clauses of the Bill at the moment, particularly in terms of um, phrases like um, encouragement in Section 5, encouragement of applications by women, appointing person for a public board must make, uh, must make such steps as it considers appropriate. Again, that's a very subjective phrase, and I think it would, there's no test to that, there's no threshold or, or suggestion. Similarly, I think there was a... a in, in terms of the um, consideration of candidate section, subsection 4, uh, the appointing person must consider whether the appointment of a candidate identified under section 2 who is not a woman is justified on the basis of a characteristic or situation particular to that candidate, and if so, may give preference to that candidate. Again, a very subjective clause which, uh, which anyone could find a, a reasonably coherent narrative as to why they pick this man over this woman for a particular circumstance to that character. Well, the board... Um, offer us their reflections on whether they think those sections are strong enough and, and how we might tighten those. Bill Thompson. So can I just point out, ministers are required to disclose the reasons for appointment. So that has to be credible. Um, if it's not credible, anybody disappointed by the outcome has, first of all, a right of complaint, and ultimately, although this is extreme and probably would never happen, um, could take minister to the court for judicial yeah. review. It has happened uh, at a UK level fairly spectacularly. Um, so um, I, I don't think it's as free and easy as it might sound. And but judgment... we're not just talking about ministers here. We're talking about people who are appointing boards at lower levels within public authorities as well. Well, the bulk of these are regulated appointments which are made by ministers. Uh, and ministers do actually publish statistics, um, whether they do it directly or not, 
And by the way, I didn't come here to blow my own trumpet. My annual report contains a lot of statistics, which are figures provided by the government, um, and, and they're checked over annually. Um, so the, a lot of the information is out there already. Um, people just, in a broad sense, haven't been interested enough to, to take enough interest in it. And I think what this bill is trying to do is, given that there is momentum towards gender diversity, it's trying to make sure that there's no backsliding, uh, that we don't lose the gains that have been made. Um, and the, the margin at the moment is quite small in terms of gender diversity. Um, so I don't think we should get too worried about um, the discretions that are in the bill, because it won't always be appropriate for women to be appointed. I, I get all that, and I, and I think that you know you you illuminated us with the statistics about how things are improving just organically out there, and that's great news. And but I, I think you make the point that rightly that this bill is to stop backsliding to to so that should we have a slightly more less progressive administration in the future that wasn't very interested in diversity that they would be held by the, the strictures of this Act. My concern is that there aren't very many strictures in this Act because there is a lot of get-outs and, and wiggle room, like the, the idea that, you know, that they've taken such steps as they seem appropriate. Yeah, of course. Um, in relation to, to um, the taking such steps as it considered appropriate, I would agree it's not the strongest wording you could have. Uh, reasonable steps, perhaps, would be better. At least mm -hmm. that has an objective. Uh, definition, or can be looked at objectively. Um, the change, I think, to uh, the reasons why you wouldn't appoint the woman in a tie-break situation, I think the wording previously was exceptional circumstances, yeah, yeah and there's now basis Justified. of a characteristic. Um, I like basis of a characteristic because I think for us that makes clear that the div other diversity which the man may hold may be important at that point in the diversity of the board, so may be um, at, from the BME community are disabled. Um, I think those are issues that should be looked at. Uh, it could uh, amount to those exceptional circumstances. I think situation particular to the candidate is certainly weaker. So again, perhaps some kind of middle ground there. In relation to the reporting, you're probably aware there's already for an awful lot of the, board, of the, the organisations here a reporting duty in the public sector duties, yeah. specifically in relation to diversity on boards. Um, it should have well, it came into force last year and the first reporting should have been done this year but has been delayed for various reasons. And that is not only uh, saying how many men and women you have in your board, it's also setting out the actions that you've taken to improve diversity in the board and the actions that you intend to take going forward. So it's very explicit and would expect boards to be actually publishing, this is what I've done, this is what I'm going to do, this is where I'm at, and that's public reporting. Um, now, that will not cover, I think, all of the bodies that are listed here, um, uh, certainly at the moment. I don't know whether there's a way of bringing those other bodies into that kind of reporting regime. I'm guessing that's why the, the reporting bit has been left to regulation, to try and work out how those two pieces will fit together. But I think that's a relatively strong reporting duty that's there. Let's go. I think it's quite interesting around the, what public sector bodies are required to report, and I think it's really important that what public bodies intend to do, what they've done, and how that's actually improved the overall um, proportions of, of gender or other characteristics on, on their board is it really important. I think keeping the, um, the specific requirements around the progress that's being made rather than the individual numbers is probably quite important. Again, for the reasons of you know, num boards with very small numbers, it actually gets quite difficult to report on that. Um, so I think it probably is more important, I think, to focus on the, with the reporting on the actions that are being taken and the progress that has been made as a result of the actions. Okay, okay just, just on progress, Bill Thompson, uh, you gave us some uh, incredibly interesting figures at the start, from 36% all the way up to 45.8%. Is there any particular actions that were key in making that change? Because that's only over about two and a half years. So yes. Is there anything key that, that maybe that, that has been done in that intervening period that has allowed that progress? My view of that is uh, political will has changed the whole um, agenda um, and the climate. And of course, it's at a time when there is wider interest in gender equality 
uh, across society, not just in terms of um, private sector financial performance. Um, it is an issue which is on the agenda in a different way. Yeah. Um, and if I have any concerns about this bill, uh, it is simply that it puts the focus on gender equality where significant progress is being made. And there is a, a risk, albeit a small one, that other areas of diversity where improvement is required have to play second fiddle, okay. as it were. OK, we, we, we hear that. We've, we've read. Annie Wells, you wanted to come in on the tie-break question. Yes. I thought that was a really <clears> good segue. And then I've got Gail, so yeah. you, we've got a short amount of time left. So. Thanks, convener. Morning, panel. Um, obviously, Lynn had touched on the tiebreaker, sort of an issue that we've came up against last week and this week. Um, and looking through the bill, for me, there's no, there is no actual we must achieve 50-50 in the bill because we know it's anonymous applications as well. We know anonymous sifting happens. What would happen if we, to get, to get gender balance, we needed a female on the board, but during the sifting process, it was two males who come up. Again, I know we've got parts in the bill that say as long as consideration has been put in place and, and reasonable structure. However, if we are trying to achieve 50-50, we must actually have something there because merit sits at the heart of this bill as far as I can see. However, how do we then... Encouragement is absolutely brilliant. I would encourage anyone to apply for any aspect of life to get more women involved, but I don't see how the bill actually gets us to 50-50 completely. I'm sorry, this is not the answer you're looking for. Um, I think you have to have faith in the ability of women. I if absolutely I, do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> but if you have faith in the ability of women, uh, if the process is truly open and if appointment is made on merit, then it follows logically that at least 50% of appointees will be women. Can I just come back in at that point? Um, absolutely, I encourage women wholeheartedly. However, if it's an anonymous sifting at the start, and two men, for example, come out as the initial candidates. How do we make sure that we, we are not... We need to have something in place, because we know from past experiences that women undersell themselves. We know men will, if there's eight items on a, a jobs list, men will say, I can do seven or eight of them. Women will naturally say they undersell themselves, and it's, it's been proven. However, I would love to see gender diversity on boards, but the tie-break situation as well also excludes other characteristics. Are we taking gender over BME, over disability, over LGBT? What I don't understand and what I don't get from the bill is there is nothing there in place to say that if we need two female members for the board, we will get that through what the bill's trying to offer. I, I don't see that completely. Bill Thompson, unless I'll come back to you. Um, it, if... If a man is the best candidate, then the man should be appointed, as far as I'm concerned, because I think merit is the key to this. Um, but the process has been opened up. Uh, you're entirely correct. Women have a different attitude. People like me are more willing to have a go and just put our names forward. Um, and in generalities, women don't feel the same way about it. So there have been adjustments made to the process, to the way that mm -hmm. uh, the criteria have been set. Um, and although the political will has been critical to that, that political will allows people to put effort into doing that in a way which allows women to put themselves forward. And I agree, it shouldn't just be women. Uh, Lynn Welsh made the point earlier, um, the best candidate may be a man who's also mm -hmm. disabled. He may be young in the sense of the, the, the bar set at 49. A lot of us wouldn't think 49 is particularly young, but we're struggling um, overall to get people under 49. Mm -hmm on boards. So if you have a 45-year-old man, mm -hmm. why not? Liz Scott. Yes, I, I think it just stresses the importance of, of really building that talent pipeline coming through. And there are lots of initiatives that are around through people like Changing the Chemistry who are really trying to build the capability of, of good women who've got potential, who've got the ability um, to contribute um, to boards. And I think it just really stresses that if we're doing a lot of work around those areas, those women will come through so that when you end up with your, your selection, you're getting many more women coming through who've got the level of ability to, to get the appointment on merit. 
Okay. One. You just add. Yeah, obviously it, it depends how you define merit mm -hmm. <laughs> or what you're actually looking for. Or As importantly, there's been you. the right to take positive action for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, and that can include not only encouraging people to apply, you don't have to do all your sifting anonymously. It is good practice in lots of uh, different mm -hmm. areas. Um, in, uh, in gender, actually, there's some very uh, good suggestions about how you can make sure that women are being interviewed if that mm. is your concern. But at the end of the day, it must be on merit because otherwise you're discriminating. But how you get people to the point where you're making that final decision, mm -hmm. there's a lot of availability of, of positive action that would be lawful that you could take to ensure that women are, are mm. at that interview stage. I think ju just one thing, I mean, I absolutely agree that we need to encourage women to and get the pipeline. I think mentoring is a, a fantastic thing. Again, the anonymity of applications is probably one of the things that I would still be quite concerned at because I know that's what happens just now on public boards. It's, it's, it's not a requirement, public convener. Requirement is okay. Mm. <laughs> lots, lots to, to think about. Gail Ross. Thank you, Good morning, well, um, it's, uh, it's a round-up question. We've heard that the figures for gender balance are actually quite good at the moment through voluntary measures. Um, there's a lot of good work being done to encourage and inform women about what their role would be on a board, um, how they can use their experience and knowledge to influence decision making. And there's a lot of good work, I'll reference the HIE paper on occupational segregation as well, which is very important. Um, if all the good work is being done through voluntary measures, is this bill therefore necessary? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and why? <laughs> <laughs> because there is very good practice in a number of organisations and none in some. And a way has to be found to lift the, the those uh, perhaps more recalcitrant um, uh, bodies to the correct level. I also think it sends out an excellent signal uh, in relation to equality altogether. This is, should not just be about boards. This will start to trickle down into all sorts of other areas um, that, that uh, these boards will be in contact with. Thank you. I fully endorse that comment. The workforce that I mentioned at the start of the, the session is largely a female workforce, and I think that gender representation is very, very meaningful in that context. I would say yes as well, and it's not often as a public organisation we ask for more legislation. Um, but the reality is, as a society, it's good for us. As an organisation, it's good for us. So we would fully support it. Okay, Liz? I think as well, it's an important way of raising awareness, not just within the public bodies, but across um, Scottish society, um, about the, the place that, in this case, women um, can take in public boards. But it is also important that that's reflected across the other characteristics, I think, as well. Bill, you'd mentioned earlier about you needed, we needed the legislation in order not to have a rollback. Mm -hmm. would, would you perceive that if there was a change of political will, because that was one of the drivers that you said that was making the change, if there's a change in that political will, if we don't have the legislation, do you perceive there would be a rollback? There certainly would be a, a risk of that, I agree. OK. OK. Uh, I've got a final question, and it's on guidance. One of the, the issues that we had arose last week from the two panels that we had was uh, organisations looking for actual guidance, and the, the bill doesn't give provision for, for public uh, um, guidance in, uh, on public bodies. Thinking, what, what would your opinion be of having a set of guidance that goes along with the bill? Would that help? Because I know that you're, you've been involved in writing some guidance. For... Uh, there is guidance on in terms of ministerial public appointments. Um, Others have already mentioned there's quite a lot of guidance available already. Um, the government produces um, a document, uh, an online document called On Board, which has a certain amount of guidance, and I think it would be relatively easy to uh, expand that if, if it was felt that there were okay. things that were missing. OK. There's quite a lot of guidance positive action more generally. That might be at least a good basis for, for more specific guidance for the legislation, if that was thought to be... You did. Good, that's what we like, to be pointed in the right direction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any other comments from the panel this morning? You've all been very disciplined. Well done. Jimmy. Um, I, I appreciate we've done a, a quick round on whether you think legislation is required or not. I didn't quite get to the 
a conclusion on whether you think further enforcement or sanctions should be included. And I wonder if we could just have a quick yes or no on that. Sanctions are because that was a conversation. True, but I, I got, yeah, I got yeah. quite mixed feelings on it. I, okay. I got the impression. I personally don't think a sanction would be appropriate, other than through the reporting and the naming and shaming means that we already have available. Thank you. Okay. I think something like our compliance notice type sanction might well be appropriate. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Uh, that's very I agree with James's comment. I, do, I don't think that is necessarily the way to go, but there are other ways of holding us to account. Yeah, okay. Think reporting. Reporting. Okay. Bill, do you have a view on this? I've, I've expressed my views. I have nothing to add. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much this morning for your uh, contributions and my usual proviso. If you go away and you think I should have said this or offered that, please do that because we've got a bit of a journey to go on this bill and we'd be keen to hear from you. But we're very grateful for your written evidence and your oral evidence this morning. Thank you so much. I'm going to suspend committee uh, for a quick comfort break for about five minutes to allow us to change panels. So I now suspend. <laughs>
Good morning and welcome back to the uh, Equality and Human Rights uh, Committee. This morning we're going to continue on with our agenda item one, which is our continued scrutiny of the gender representation on public boards uh, bill. And with us on our second panel this morning, we have Ken Milroy, who's the chair of Colleges Scotland, Sheena Stewart, who's the university secretary, University of Aberdeen, Dundee and convener of the secretary's group of University Scotland, uh, Stephanie Miller, who is a senior policy advisor at the Equality Challenge Unit, and Mary Senior, who is a Scot Scotland official at University College Union Scotland, and Andrea Bradley, who is the Assistant Secretary for Education and Equalities at the Educational Institute of Scotland. Can I thank you all for coming along this morning? We're really keen to hear from you, and thank you for your, your written evidence. I think you gave us all lots to read this week, um, so we're very grateful for that. It helps us inform our questions. I'm going to do the same as I did with the first panel and ask you just to very, very quickly give us a wee oversight of who you are, what you do, and why you think the bill is either is important or, or not important. And if I could start with you, Andrea. Um, OK, so um, as you outlined, I'm Assistant Secretary with the Educational Institute of Scotland, which is the biggest teacher trade union in Scotland. So we have an interest in this because of the um, public boards, sorry, the college boards dimension and because of the university um, governing bodies dimension to it. And in addition to that, we're a, we're a part of the wider trade union movement and the, the, the Women's Committee in particular of the STUC has been a long-standing advocate for 50-50 representation on public boards. So um, within my remit um, as Assistant Secretary with Responsibility for Education and Equality, this is, a, you know, this is an area that cuts right across um, significant parts of the work that I do. Um, so the, the EIS has made uh, several contributions in the, um, you know, the legislative process around this and in other fora uh, related to this to this campaigning issue. So it's an ongoing, long-standing um, area of interest for us. OK, thank you very much. Ken? Uh, good morning, convener, uh, committee members. Um, College of Scotland welcomes the opportunity to give uh, evidence to the committee. Um, College of Scotland is the membership body for uh, all of Scotland's colleges, 26 colleges um, across our 13 regions. Um, so we are providing training uh, and education to 220, uh, 227,000 students. Um, we employ 11,000 staff, 61% um, female, 39% male. Um, governance has been um, critical to uh, the, the, the sector over the past few years uh, since uh, the, uh, the regionalisation of the, of the <coughs> college sector. Um, and we've supported that through the establishment of the, the college's Good Governance Steering Group. It has um, produced a, a, good, a code of good governance uh, that was published in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2014 and then updated in two th 2016. So uh, diversity issues have been part of our considerations in terms of our overall governance uh, position. Um, we've done a, a recent snapshot just in terms of where we've got to in terms of our, our board position uh, and it's slightly improved uh, in terms of gender equality from the position in the paper. So we're now at 59% male, 41% female. Um, I would say that prob probably about a third of our members of boards across the country uh, are appointed externally. So uh, we're looking at probably about two thirds of those that are appointed by the boards themselves. Thank you very much. S Stephanie. Morning. Um, uh, I work for the Equality Challenge Unit, which is a UK wide organisation that supports universities across the UK and colleges in Scotland to <coughs> implement their equality responsibilities as effectively as, as possible. We work across um, governance staff and students in Scotland and a significant part of our work at the moment is supporting um, college governance. We have pr we produced research in 2014, um, Governing Bodies, Equality and Diversity in Scottish Higher Education Institutions, which unpicked some of the issues around diversity for the board itself, but also their knowledge in terms of diversity. Um, and we've also produced guidance of, for college board members and university governors on um, their <coughs> roles and responsibility in relation to, to governance. That's great. Thanks very much. Mary. Um, hello, convener. 
Um, I'm Mary Senior, I'm from the University and College Union and in Scotland uh, UCU represents uh, academic and academic related staff in Scotland's universities and we're the largest union um, in the higher education sector. Um, so our interest is primarily in relation to university governing bodies, um, often known as courts. And we're very clear that there's been real progress over the past couple of years in terms of gender balance in uh, university university governing bodies, but we're clear that this is um, no doubt due to the scrutiny that's been on the university sector over the past couple of years, particularly around governance, and, and, and that there has been criticism in the past in terms of uh, diversity, and um, I think that focus and the spotlight that's been on the sector has really um, in, uh, encouraged the sector to, to make changes, and we very much welcome um, those changes. But our message today, I think, is to uh, not take uh, the foot off the gas in terms of this issue and actually to cement um, the good progress that has been made. And that's why we're very supportive um, of, the, of, of the bill that, that you're considering today. Thank you, Mary. Gina. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Gina Stewart. I'm currently convener of the University of Scotland Secretaries Group. Uh, University of Scotland is a representative body of the 19 higher education institutions in Scotland and the secretaries as a group are responsible for corporate governance and for managing the appointment of governors. Um, so it's a, a matter very close to our heart. Um, as a, a sector, we're very supportive of the aim set out in the bill in terms of gender and, and the requirement to have the best qualified candidate. And as Mary said, we've worked very hard successfully over the past few years to have more balanced uh, gender representation on our governing bodies. Uh, we have an issue about being included in, in the bill, however. We, we're not public bodies. Uh, we don't have public boards. We are autonomous, not-for-profit, uh, charitable institutions. Uh, but that's not to say we're resistant to the aim uh, at all and, and the practices included, which we think are, are standard practice uh, for, for our institutions. We have a code which was produced in 2013 where, where equality uh, and diversity and having targets are a core part of that. Uh, we're just about to publish a, an update to that where it, there's a further emphasis to leadership of governing bodies in equality and diversity. Um, and we currently have 47% of um, positions that are appointed by governing bodies are women, so that excludes those who are elected, who are excluded from the bill, uh, and 10 of the 19 institutions exceed the bill's aim currently, so uh, five in fact have more women than men. So a huge amount of work has gone on, not just through uh, the, the points mentioned earlier in terms of uh, sort of pressure to change, but I think internally as well, we have uh, changed as a community a lot of work um, working with the Quality Challenge Unit and other organisations such as the Leadership Foundation to, uh, to have a more diverse board in many respects, including gender. Hi, thank you very much. A nice uh, round up there of what you, what you do. I'm going to go straight into questions and start with Mary again. Thank you, Convener, and good, good morning, panel, and, and thank you for providing us with your um, written evidence. I'm going to um, pose the same question to this panel that I did to the, the, the previous one, and that's around um, the concerns that have been raised that the bill is not inclusive of trans women and has a, a binary definition of, of gender, so people that identify as, as non-binary are not included in this in this bill, and I'd be interested in your view on whether or not some change should be made to the legislation. But in addition to that, um, given the, the organisations that, that you represent, can I ask what each organisation does to make sure it is inclusive of, of trans women and non-binary individuals? Who'd like to start? I think we did make a point uh, in our submission regarding um, that, that very point that you're making there, um, because obviously uh, we, we have a lot of dialogue internally regarding uh, trans matters. Uh, you know, it's a matter close mm -hmm. to our students' heart. Um, so uh, we, we, we felt that that was an issue. Uh, you know, if you are going mm -hmm. to have something, it should, it should yeah. be inclusive. Um, I'll just leave it at that, I think, and, and allow others to, okay. to answer. Okay, thank you. I guess one related issue, a point that we've made in our submission is um, the need to have um, at least 50% women on a board as opposed to 50-50 gender balance because um, I think most trade unions and 
organisations which have um, set quotas uh, to say ha have gone for the at least approach because it can be more inclusive in the way that you're you're saying, uh, mm. Mary. Um, in terms of um, work that UCU has done in terms of encouraging um, trans um, participation within our organisation, I guess at, at a UK level, um, you know, we've said, set across a, an open and inclusive message and we have had a recent um, seminar on trans um, and other LGBT um, issues, but, you know, I accept I think all organisations can, can do, um, do more on this agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, I think for us there is a wider point. I, I fully accept that uh, the definitions in the in the bill maybe aren't broad enough to include anything outside the, the binary um, question. But for us, we would like to see that the bill went further than that again. Um, there is the fact focusing on gender alone actually is, is taking us down a route which is forcing people to overemphasize one protected characteristic over another protected characteristic. Um, to get back to your original question, though, um, ECU recently produced guidance on um, supporting trans staff and students in colleges and universities, which might be useful. Um, and mm. there's nothing in that bill that wouldn't be able to be extended to governance. Okay. Uh, mm. the, sorry, the, the, the guidance. Okay. That wouldn't can be can I just governance. come back? When you say that the bill should go further, yes. can you be a bit more specific in what you would like to see? Well, for us, the. <coughs> Focusing on gender, it's, it's, it is important, but I think, as Ken said, that sometimes the difference in men and women on boards mm. may not be as strong as in other places. And most colleges and universities, in fact, all colleges and universities, are legally required under the Equality Act to report on all protected mm. characteristics and under Section 6A to plan, advance, plan in advance for board acts of succession in terms of all protected characteristics. And our concern is slightly that having a focus on gender mm. may Narrows it down, take yeah. away from yeah. the current legal requirements because they're, they're only in regulations. OK, thank you. That's helpful. Ken? Um, we, we noted that that is an area of concern uh, in our submission. Um, and I don't think that's reflected uh, in terms of the specifics uh, in, in the, the processes that we have in place just now. So if we were wanted to be minded to be much more inclusive and actually take this, I think we would need to give that further consideration. Um, and um, perhaps there is a need for some further guidance around how that might be achieved. But it's not an area that we've actively looked at through the Good Governance Group. OK, thank you. Andrea? Yeah, it's an area that um, I think we referenced in our in our submission mm -hmm. as well. You know, to suggest that there was potential for the bill to be to be more inclusive of mm -hmm. um, transgender women in particular. Um, in terms of the work that the EIS has done around that, we have an LGBT informal network which um, contributes quite significantly to policy development within our within our organisation, and there are. Um, events that are organised by and for that uh, network of LGBT members and it has been particularly active um, in the last couple of years. So it's an area that is gathering momentum in terms of the interest of our members and in terms of the confidence of our members to identify um, around that, you know, those characteristics and to be active around it. Um, the STUC recently produced um, guidance on transgender workers, which may be of interest to you. That's guidance that we've recommended to our own members. And in the last few years, we updated guidance for our, um, for our members around LGBT matters, not only applicable to, um, to teachers and lecturers, but applicable to children and young people who may identify um, as being lesbian, gay, bi, trans, or um, you know, some other uh, uh, gender identity. So we've done quite a lot of work in that in recent years. OK, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thanks very much. Um, Jimmy. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to deviate slightly from my previous line of questioning, if that's OK. Oh, OK, um, then. Yeah, uh, well, we have a different panel, so I'm quite keen to, <laughs> to get... I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback on my microphone. Um, I'll sit away. Um, can you hear me OK? <clears throat> uh, can I ask... Uh, I have a very specific question to EIS. Um, in your submission, uh, and this will maybe... I can widen this out to the rest of the panel. You say that you welcome the decision to legislate in this area because voluntary initiatives have not been sufficient to achieve equal representation. Uh, I don't know if you were here for the last panel or not, but we just heard from the Commissioner that we're currently sitting at 45.8%. To me, that sounds like quite good progress. So could you justify your position on that? 
45.8% falls short still of 50-50 um, and the progress towards that percentage has been relatively slow. Um, certainly um, in recent years there has been a gathering of momentum around it and a lot of that progress has been, um, you know, has been relatively recent. Um, I think we were working with um, maybe different stats from you. We had a, a stats um, gathered in 2015 that suggested that women's representation on public boards was sitting at something around about 35 to 36%. You know, so there's still quite significant significant deficit there. So we were maybe working with a different set of statistics from you were um, at, at the point at which the submission was made. In terms of why we would say that the legislation was necessary, clearly, you know, volunteerism hasn't um, delivered the 50-50 balance that we would that we would be looking for, or at least 50-50 balance that we would be, uh, or 50, f at least 50% uh, female representation that we would be looking for. So we would suggest that the legislation could add further propulsion towards, towards the, the realisation realis of that ambition. Obviously, legislation on its own won't achieve that. You know, there are other cultural changes that need to occur, but we think that the, the legislation could be a further precipitation towards that, uh, towards that aspiration. Do you think the legislation actually does that in its current form? I think uh, some of the, the members in the committee feel that perhaps it doesn't really go far enough to do anything. It just states that you should consider uh, candidates upon merit first and foremost. And then if you're in a presenting situation where you have two candidates of equal merit, one male, one female, preference should be given to the female. And if you don't, there's the, all you have to do is report that you didn't. So does it actually achieve the, you know, what, what you want to achieve? Um, I'm, we're, we're not suggesting that the, that the the draft legislation in its current form is, is perfect and is going to be the panacea to this, but it's certainly a step in the right direction and it may be that over time there have to be um, amendments or adjustments to the legislation if this is not found to deliver the ambitions as, you know, as, as are set out. Um, our, our position is that not, not just in relation to this to this piece of work, but ambition on its own doesn't deliver doesn't deliver on on aspirations. There has to be other support to organisations <coughs> in order that they can, um, you know, that they can maybe shift mindsets and um, change you know change people's perceptions in order to in order to have everybody working together towards what the what the aspiration should be. Um, thus far, um, there hasn't been there hasn't been enough done to um, you know to balance the, the representation of women on on boards and not just on boards actually but within you know within employment structures and promotion structures and so on so this is really just one part of um, a bigger piece of work that I think needs to be undertaken over a longer a longer period of time but we have to start somewhere and this is a this is a start okay thank you I'm happy to open that out to the rest of the panel Thank you. Um, just to, for your information, we already have quite a transparent um, regulatory regime in this respect. Uh, for example, uh, our code of practice is accepted by the Scottish Funding Council as good practice uh, and requires us to, to set targets in this area. Um, and we're required to report on that, so it's a, a reporting uh, regime as well. In addition, we, we submit our statistics, including uh, the diversity of our governing boards, to the Higher Education Statistics Agency. So I think that in addition to the, the Code of Good Practice and, and the, the requirement to meet that, it's a condition of grant as well that we mm. address those issues. So there is already that, that regime in place within higher education institutions in Scotland. Shuna, if I could just pick you up on that point, I mean, it, it slightly conflicts your opening statement in the sense that you want to be exempt from this because you're autonomous, non-public bodies, but you've just referenced the Scottish Funding Council, which is very much a public funding body. Absolutely. So how do you, uh, how do you square that yes, circle? So, uh, we don't see it as contradictory at all. Um, the, uh, the relationship there is that we, you know, for, for a certain amount of proportion of our funding comes from the public, uh, from the Scottish Government and obviously other parts from the UK Government and other sources. But for that part where we, we are given grant, it's quite right that we have responsibility to report on the use of that grant. Um, and so for those aspects, we, we are quite comfortable with uh, that code of practice and the comply or explain approach uh, through that, you know, that, that link on, on public funding. Uh, we have other uh, so, authorities sorry. across the UK. Does that, that, does that mean that, you, the, that the gender balance is only applicable on the public yeah. element of the funding? And therefore, no, you can't. I'm you, a bit confused. No, not at all. You can't um, di divide it up that way at all. You know, we, we recognise that we are autonomous institutions, but we have responsibility to those who, who, who grant us funding. And that, in some cases, will be the funding council. In other cases, it will be, for example, research councils, where uh, when when we are undertaking research, we're also required to demonstrate uh, equality of opportunity, etc. 
So I think in, in being autonomous institutions, in responding, whether it's to uh, OSCO, the charity organisation, whether it's the funding council, whether it's uh, the research councils, we, we, we have embedded it and mainstreamed equality uh, and diversity. And, and you know, that's right and good, but, but I think that's different from seeing us as, as having public boards which, I, which we don't, uh, and that's been acknowledged by, for example, Audit Scotland, and I think in, in some of the, the government's own papers for the bill, recognise that we are autonomous institutions. Okay. Did you want to come in on that point? Yeah. Yeah, just as I mean, Sheen is right, uh, universities are autonomous bodies, but they do receive £1.5 billion, quite rightly, of um, Scottish Government uh, money um, to do the um, education, research, teaching, etc. Um, so I guess that's why we think it's really important that they are um, accountable and, and should be included in this bill. Um, I think it's also right that universities have made, uh, you know, real strides forward in terms of uh, gender balance over the past number of years. But I think that's because there has been a lot of scrutiny, um, you know, that they have been under the spotlight and, and politicians, Scottish Government ministers have, be, have been asking questions. Um, I think one point, uh, to pick up a point that Sheena had said about um, the, the number of women on uh, boards in, in universities, um, I guess boards only appoint um, so many, uh, a proportion of their uh, members directly, and there's other categories of members, either from staff, from senate, from alumni, sometimes from local authorities, and, and so on. And we actually think incorporating all of those uh, members within the, this, the ambit of this legislation would be a very positive step because it then encourages other bodies or, or places an onus on other bodies, such as local authorities, such as student associations, such as trade unions ourselves. Um, when we are uh, presenting nominations to the governing bodies, yeah. we too have to take gender balance in, into account. And we think that's really important. And um, the legislation as it, it currently stands uh, wouldn't include those other like local authority alumni and, and so on. And, and I think you know, we would ask that you, you do include um, all of the parts of the university body because you know that they are contributing and then it has um, a knock-on effect to other areas of society which which you know should be taking diversity and gender balance um, into account yeah okay Jimmy thank you interesting um, Alex Cole thank you convener. good morning to the panel thank you for coming to see us today um at the last session we heard about the organic growth yes. and the differential in the statistics andrea that you identified that yes that was a position in 2015 but things have improved quite significantly since then um however i think i think it was bill thompson that rightly made the point that this legislation is to here um, to stop backsliding so that should we happen upon a less enlightened time where that organic growth were to be reversed um, that there would be legislation to underpin it to make sure that we couldn't um, however I made the point at the last session and we, we picked it up and I'd like to do so again that without meaningful teeth or just disability this uh, this this bill is largely meaningless um, if it's about um, if there's wiggle room, if there's not sufficient sanction within it. Um, I'd like to, to ask the panel about that. I, we do have the reporting duty, and that is all we have right now. And the, the last panel seemed to think that was sufficient, and that naming and shaming institutions that weren't um, meeting the aspirations of the Act uh, would be enough. But I'd be very keen to hear your view on that, and whether we need anything else in the bill. Stephanie. Um, in relation, to, I think there's two aspects that I'd like to address. In relation to the first point, I, I, I would agree with Bill. I think there has been quite significant progress in the college and university sector over the past few years. The numbers are increasing. They're not going far enough. And there is a risk that by not providing some legislative underpinning, as you say, there could be backsliding. Now, that could be from a national agenda, but it could also be from a local perspective as well. If you have a change of board members who don't take it quite as seriously, there is a risk that that could that could have uh, go backwards. So I think from from that point of view, the the bill is necessary. In terms of a kind of a follow on from that, then is that if you're talking about sanctions, it, you need to then understand there are lots of reasons why boards have board member fluctuations and and how difficult it can be to get board members at all, let alone uh, you know types of board members that you would be specifically looking for. Um, so in terms of um, measures to approach that, um, we would suggest that um, colleges and universities currently have to comply with the specific duties regulations in Scotland. 
and report on equality progress every four years with updates every two. And something that either fed into that process or mirrored that process, partly to reduce onerous workload on institutions who have to do all of these other things as well, or, um, but also just to kind of smooth the process over. Sanctions, especially punitive ones, um, could actually have a slightly detrimental effect um, uh, on how people approach this, and it could ultimately lead to a lack of meritocracy, because the sanction would mean they'd have to appoint women rather than a woman of merit. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I mentioned the number of, of members that we have across our boards in the college sector. Um, the majority of them are volunteers, uh, so they come from communities right across Scotland. Um, the majority of our boards are, are charitable organisations, so I would be concerned about unintended consequences in terms of sanctions, that we actually put people off uh, giving of their time uh, in terms of what they want to give back in terms of the college sector or other public uh, services. So I think I think we need to think carefully about the sanctions issue. Um, I, I think the reporting, the monitoring I, and the visibility of that is really important. Um, and I think uh, if, the, if the bill uh, goes to reinforce that, I think that's welcome. But the sanctions, I would, I would caution uh, around that. Sheena? Uh, yes, I'd, I agree with that. Um, we, we have volunteers from all parts of the community on our boards. Um, we already have the reporting that Stephanie re uh, talked about. We have transparency in our annual accounts where we, we talk about these aspects as well. Um, and, and also, I think, in addition, the, the Committee of Scottish Chair's own aim of having 40-40-20 allows for that flexibility that we need to have <coughs> at, at, at some points. People have uh, periods of office of two or three years. Uh, sometimes they may step down early. You have a, a, a period of time in which the, the balance may change temporarily. Um, so I think having that wiggle room, if you like, um, is very helpful. Uh, and for someone like me who's managing the process and, and trying to, to find good applicants coming through, having that, that sort of uh, scope is, is helpful. Okay. If I may convene it, thank you. You mentioned the word wiggle room, Sheena, and um, I know that I'm not alone in this committee in believing that there is a substantial amount of wiggle room in the pages of this bill so far, particularly in clauses around the justification principle in terms of when we decide to appoint a man over a woman, um, and indeed in the encouragement of applications of women which talk about the appointing person taking such steps as they deem appropriate. In the absence of statutory guidance, because we understand there will be no statutory guidance underpinning this, how can we strengthen that to be sure that it isn't just entirely subjective so that people will tick boxes and say, well, I did everything I could and, and we just had to appoint the guy? I'd be very keen to hear how the panel think we could, um, A, strengthen the bill, but B, do you think we actually do need statutory guidance to define what appropriate steps mean? Um, I would wholly endorse um, having statutory guidance um, underneath the bill, partly because if you are considering sanctions, it's, it's an unbalanced process. If you're considering sanctions without giving boards very adequate support and a framework, particularly when you're talking, I think it's clause four, about the, the choosing between two suitably qualified candidates. Um, if you don't have that guidance underpinning, you're, you're, you, you are arguably setting boards up to fail on yeah. that as well. Agreed. You said in your that we thought that there should be greater or further consideration of the application of sanctions because um, voluntarism thus far hasn't delivered the ambitions as we've already talked about. But we didn't um, suggest that this be a, a heavy-handed blanket approach, that there would have to be some kind of like monitoring and maybe interrogation of why um, a public body hadn't met the requirement to... Um, you know, to, to achieve gender balance on, on its board, um, and maybe sanctions applied appropriate to the reasons why the, the body wasn't able to deliver on that. So a kind of, uh, some kind of mechanism that, that allowed for um, dialogue around that, but the, 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 for there to be maybe a penalty, or the other way of thinking about it would be incentives, provide incentives to encourage public bodies to accelerate their, their progress towards this. We've seen that applied in, in, other, in other aspects of, of, of public policy. But our, our, our um, um, 
um, coverage in, in, of the, the sanctions area in our submission did suggest that there needed to be further consideration given to, to that to, for, for the reasons that you've outlined yourself to give the, the legislation more teeth. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Sorry, I was thinking about something. Yeah. <laughs> um, good morning and thanks, convener. Um, I asked a question at the, the, the last session just on the tie break situation. We've kind of covered it a little bit, I think, in, in Alex's question. Um, how do we ensure that if we are looking for one member of a board to take that to 50 50? How do we? How is it done at the moment? I would be interested to know how it's done at the moment with the universities, but also how do we ensure from kick-off that we are going to guarantee 50-50 on a public board if merit is at the heart of this bill? Could I start on that one? Um, just in terms of uh, how, we, how it happens within universities in terms of appointing and, and seeking applicants and, and making decisions. Uh, we usually we all uh, draw up uh, skills and gender matrices so we're identifying whenever a vacancy arises or is about to arise, uh, what the A, first of all, the skills are that the, the board uh, will need. And some of those will come from our governing orders or statutory instruments. Uh, and secondly, we're, we're looking at all aspects of, of diversity in terms of age, gender, uh, disability, etc., uh, so that we, we know uh, sort of going in what, uh, and, and that can help you know, in advertising specifically. Uh, our nominations committees, which usually in, involve, I think all of them involve staff and student governors as well, uh, will have that. Usually they'll have had training on unconscious bias, etc. Um, and there will be an, an, an awareness that, first of all, we're looking for those skills that we've identified, uh, and, and B, that um, we, may, we will have a view, we will have a, that known matrix of, of what our gender uh, breakdown, our, our diversity make, breakdown is on our boards. So we're, we're going into the interviews and nominations committee meetings with that information to hand. I can expand on that if you like, but I think that's hopefully sufficient to give you an idea. Um, so thanks very much for that. So with that, do, are we excluding anyone during that? process then so uh, if we are going in with a gender matrix and a, a sort of a skills matrix are we then excluding anyone from being a member of that board due to their gender i think I or think we, other we, diverse characteristics yes it, we try and take it across protected characteristics and i think that there has been a difficulty and you've probably heard this from other people about mm -hmm. attracting uh, women to, to put their names forward and to apply, uh, and p people with disability, uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds, etc. So we, you know, we we have worked closely with the Equality Challenge Unit to try and reach out in various ways. Uh, one way we've we've dealt with it is is in some universities and, and higher education institutions is inviting people to be co-opted onto committees of the governing body, where they can uh, get insight into the the workings of the board, uh, and determine for themselves whether they're interested in, in applying or not. And that's been a very helpful route to broaden out uh, what was traditionally, I, I think, seen as a very sort of mono, monotone uh, board. Uh, so I think the main thing for us would be the skills. Uh, you know, these are multi-million pound organisations. Uh, the skills could be varied. It could be uh, having, having a view of a stakeholder. So having some of our alumni who, who know what it's like to be a student there, uh, it, that could be an aspect of, of the skills that we're looking for. It needn't necessarily be uh, technical skills. It could be that insight. Uh, so we, we try and look at everything across the piece that way, uh, but then we will know, uh, I think, that the skills has to be the main focus of it. Yeah, I'll just get a quick supplementary on this particular point and I'll bring you back in. Yeah, just a quick question on how things are currently done at the moment. Sorry, good morning. forgot mm -hmm. you're a new panel. Um, are your interview panels gender balanced? I can only speak for my own institution in this case, um, and ours, uh, yes, they are. We, we draw upon the whole Governance and Nominations Committee, which includes uh, lay or independent governors, includes uh, staff governors and student governors. Um, and we, we will, for key, key in, uh, points, go through training as well so that they have the support that they need to, to go through the interview process. It's not, we can't guarantee it every time. Uh, 
just depending on availability sometimes. Mm -hmm. But we, we do strive for that. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask the rest of the panel? <coughs> I did. I, I, I wanted to come back to the original, <coughs> the original point about positive action yeah, yeah. and meritocracy. So then we can come, come okay. to the um, In terms of positive action, um, okay. our research in 2014 with the HEI governors mm -hmm. did show that actually governors weren't quite sure what positive action was and they misunderstood the legality of it. Uh, we currently run two um, Scotland-wide projects looking at positive action in terms of student recruitment, and promotion within staff. And what we're finding is there is a drive <coughs> towards positive action, but positive action is a spectrum and people are much more comfortable with advertising in different types of press, having gender balanced interviews, than <coughs> actually looking at something like choosing between two equal candidates um, based on a protected characteristic that they're not sure about the legality of that. So if we are going to look at a positive action measure such as choosing between two candidates um, on a, the basis of a protected characteristic, that needs to have a fair amount of guidance underpinning that and support, because the sector at the moment doesn't feel that it has the knowledge to be able to do that fairly and successfully. In terms of whether that leads to or the, the diversity across the board and, and merit, I would say that comes back to how you actually define merit on the board and that maybe we need to rethink some of the things that we're looking for in terms of board members um, and build diversity within that rather than trying to do diversity on the system that we maybe currently have. Here's a question to the other panel members about uh, gender balanced interview panels. Ken? Um, my most recent experience of uh, uh, um, appointment was our principal at uh, North East Scotland College. Uh, so there was gender balance uh, on the um, the short list and the, and the long list panel. So yes, it was it was very visible. Yep, we need appointing um, members of staff, you know, like, uh, you know, as part of the leadership team, they are appointed by a panel of lay members and there's gender balance within within that panel of, of lay members, yeah. But the, the answer in terms of the question, in terms of public bodies, I, I guess I don't know. Um, you know, as Sheena says, I think there has been real improvement, and institutions are um, very mindful of this. Um, and, and this legislation would, you know, do more to really, you know, cement that. So, um, you know, I, I think, ha or, or including that in, in some statutory guidance could be could be really helpful. Okay, Annie, do you want to come back to your substantive point? Um, no, I think I've probably got the the answer that I need, and obviously Gail's follow-up questions sort of uh, got that, so thank you very much. Gail, have you got anything else you want to ask? Yeah, just my usual wrap-up question. I think we've got quite a good flavour of whether you think the legislation is necessary or not, but just to get it on the record, do you believe that the legislation is necessary? Is that Yes, I'm we don't uh, believe it's necessary for higher education institutions. We have a regulatory regime, we have a code of good practice, and, and we have uh, more than uh, half of our institutions exceeding the current goal. Yeah, we do believe the legislation is necessary, and you know I, I think universities do have um, you know have made good progress, particularly on those members that are directly appointed by the board. Uh, but it isn't 50/50 by 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 any means, and this legislation really helps to uh, move that forward. Um, and you know we certainly think universities should be included. Okay, Stephanie. Yes, we would also agree that the legislation was necessary, while recognising that huge progress has been made recently. Um, legislation would actually show a, uh, show a clear direction, provide national leadership and enable local leadership as well. Um, with caveats, we would like a broader diversity to be considered within this and um, guidance to be added underneath. Thank you very much, Ken. The college sector welcomes this. I think it reflects what we've been doing on a voluntary basis um, and, and reaffirms what has been achieved over quite a short period of time. So, yes. Thank you. Andrea. Yep, I would concur exactly with what, what Stephanie has said. Um, this is a, you know, a really strong starting point. It's completely consistent with what we are doing within the trade union movement towards you know, achievement of greater equality and diversity. And I think that it sits very well with other um, parts of Scottish government um, ambitions. So, yeah, we would say necessary. Okay. Okay, Jimmy. Sorry, another clarification at the end. Um, Sheena, just to clarify, the question was, do you think the legislation is necessary? Um, I appreciate you gave your own position on the 
the groups that you represent, and I respect that. Um, but do you think the legislation should be applicable to everyone else? I guess if you, even if you don't want to be part of it. I, I think we have seen what what uh, codes of practice can do. Um, you know, this is not just coming from government and others. It's coming from from the population at large. You know, this is a, a groundswell, if you like. Um, I, I wouldn't like to comment on what the public organ public authorities in, in Scotland would want to do. But I think we, it can be done. Uh, we've, we've shown that it can be done. You know, we have very good results uh, voluntarily, albeit within a, a, a code of practice. Okay, thank you. Uh, given that Jamie exercised his, his right to independence in the committee this, the, this morning, the, the outstanding question that we've got left is the one on financial impact and whether you, you feel there was any financial impact. <laughs> uh, you'll have heard the questions earlier and, and you'll understand maybe where, where we're coming fr from as far as financial impact on organisations. And the panel earlier had said if you're already doing this and you're a monitoring officer and you're putting all those checks and balances into place, then it shouldn't be an impact on you. But if you're far away from from uh, where you should be, that maybe that would have a financial impact because it would involve incentives or staff training or, or all of the other things that come along with that. Thoughts, feelings, insights? Andrea, you're nodding away. Absolutely. You know, we, we've stressed that we think that there, there is definitely room for further training of um, staff who, below, who, who work for pod, public bodies, but also for current and prospective board members around all of the, you know, the aspects of equality and diversity that are pertinent in this discussion. Um, but I suppose we also need to consider what, what one of the aims of this is. It's to make public bodies more effective. And so while there might be short-term financial cost in order to achieve this gender balance, it's in pursuit of greater effectiveness and productivity and more effective output in the interest of public in the interest of the public in the longer term so surely that's an investment that is that is worth not only worth making but is necessary to make in, or, in order that our public bodies are truly serving the the whole diversity of the the the, the, the public in Scotland yeah, any other Ken the, the code of good governance that the college sector has is, is supported through uh, the college development network with training for um, our, our board members. Uh, so we already have things in place and we can prioritise uh, within that training program. That's funded through the public purse, through the funding council. So there's opportunity to influence uh, and, and shape that from the, the policy perspective but ensure that that's embedded in the practice. Um, I think that the aspect that I would welcome, uh, and I th we're beginning to see that, is not just within our sector, but across the public sector. And I think we can learn from different bits of the public sector some of the good practice that's been going on for, good, for many years. Yeah. Stephanie, your organisation's obviously in other organisations, helping them to, to make this progress. So um, you maybe have an insight into you know, the cost uh, benefit to that. Well, that was, I don't know, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I can't talk necessarily about the financial implication. I mean, there will be some boards that have to maybe reconsider their, their skills matrix, um, their recruitment process. There could be costs attached to that, especially if the staff resources that are needed as well. But um, I would echo, echo Andrea's point, which is ultimately there is fairly solid research to show that a diverse board is massively advantageous to the organisation as a whole, both financially and just from from an effectiveness point of view. And I do think those those things can be balanced. That, that counterbalances very strongly any initial financial outlay that might be necessary. OK, thank you. Mary? Yeah, I mean, to follow up Stephanie and Andrea's points, um, a more diverse board is responding more effectively to its stakeholders, its staff and, and students in the case of university. So it's potentially addressing issues around the gender pay gap, occupational segregation, um, making the you know universities more responsive to the needs of all of, of all students and the broader community. So you know I think that investment, if there is uh, any additional cost, um, is, is is well worth it in terms of the outcomes that the um, that the board and the organisation then then provides. Thank you, Sheena. Um, I think. We, we're already investing in our boards and in our staff to support our boards. Um, for example, uh, two weeks ago, I, our student president and one of our league governors attended one of the Equality Challenge Unit events on diversity and governance. We have been putting in place training. That will continue. It's a process of continuous improvement. So uh, no big increase in costs because we've already invested quite a bit, but ongoing maintenance and improvement. Uh, and as you say, there is already reporting in place for higher education institutions, um, so that is already there. 
Thank you. Jamie, any comments on... Uh, no, I mean, it's. Uh, I, I guess the, the previous um, panel asked if there is additional funding required, who should be paying for that? Should it be coming out of your budget, or should the Scottish Government make more money available to your public institutions? I think we could guess the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the bill as it stands says there's very little reference to additional funds being made available to enable this legislation to, to take place. So, Mary? these things are things that um, public bodies should be doing already for example you know if um, a female board member needs childcare costs or travel expenses um, public bodies should be providing that or, yeah. or, or already um, so you know I think that the, the previous board indicated that uh, most public bodies do require greater funding and you know we'd be happy to make the case for um, in, increased revenue for for universities and we, we will be doing that um, but I'm not sure it's to, to spend it on boards necessarily got a final comment from Alec O'Hamlin. It has to be quick and final. It just struck me that this is, this is unquantifiable without statutory guidance. So if we're asking appointing persons to take such steps as they deem necessary, there's no guidance to say what the sort of standard is for that. Then we don't know what if that's going to cost any money. So I think that there's a, a catch-22 there. Okay. okay anything, anything finally that we've missed that you've been itching to tell us? No, I think we've exhausted you this morning. We've exhausted ourselves, I think. Uh, we're very grateful for your attendance at committee this morning, for your written evidence. And again, if you go away and you think I should have said this, please please let us know. Um, uh, we've still got a way to go on this legislation. We want it to be as informed as possible. We're incredibly grateful to you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to suspend committee to go into private now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.